I'm Alia. I've been a Muslim for 28 years. I'm a wife. I'm a mother of six children. I'm a project manager for the British Islamic Medical Association and I'm also the North Branch Manager for Solis. I reverted 28 years ago. The process took about four years. Do you want me to carry on? I was um, agnostic for a while, didn't believe in anything um, in particular. I never really thought deeply about it. I had respect for religion, um, although I didn't entertain it or talk about religion at all, really. And it was only until I was about in my early 20s, I decided to take a gap year out um, before I went to university and I went to Australia. And it was then, looking back now, I realised that I was searching for God. Not searching, but realising that there must be a higher power that's greater than me, that knows everything about me and everything about life. Um, I was backpacking and I was supposed to be working and backpacking my way around the country. But unfortunately, it was a recession and it was really hard to get jobs and it was really tough. And I was going through a few tests. And I remember that we, you know, as a backpacker, you party a lot, you drink a lot. Um, and it was becoming very boring, very monotonous, very meaningless and empty. And I remember thinking, I can't tell anyone that I'm feeling this way because I'm going to be putting a dampener on, on the party. So there must be someone who knows what I'm going through that I don't have to explain myself. And looking back at that, although I never admitted at the time, I believe that was my process to believing that there could be a God or a higher power, at least at that point. There is quite a long process for me. It took four years, but quite a few amazing things happened during those four years. And one of them was when I finally got to university um, during a semester break, I decided to go home and visit my parents. And my mum said to me at that time, she said, you know, what do you want for your birthday? And I said, I'm not being really funny, but I'd, I'd really like a Bible. And she thought it was a bit weird, but, you know, cheap and cheerful, she'll get me one. And I remember when I first got it in my hands, I decided, right, I'm going to read it. And it was late at night. And I said, God, if you exist, show me a massive sign, make it massive, because if it's too small, it'll just go over my head. And I started to read and I read quite a few things that night. One of them was a chapter called Ecclesiastes. It's about a lot of things, but, you know, I started to read and it was about half past 12 and I thought, oh, it's getting a bit late. I'll just read for a little bit longer. The one thing that sticks out in my mind in that chapter was a verse that said, time here on earth is not as important as the time here in the hereafter. It really made me sit up and think, oh, wow, is, is there, a, is there a, a life beyond this life, you know, once you've gone? That resonated with me and I thought, oh, you know, that's a different concept that I've not really thought about. So I carried on reading and I thought, oh, it's getting really late and I just went to bed. In the morning, I noticed that my watch had stopped, but it was, this is telling my age, this, it was Sunday. There's nothing open on a Sunday back then. So there's no jewelers to go and fix it or anything like that. So I just left it. As the day went on, I was living with a born again Christian who came to me and said, I got you something for your birthday and gave me a Bible. I didn't have the heart to tell her that I hadn't. I'd already had one before, you know, from my mum. I just took it from her and inside was an inscription and he'd, she'd written that verse, time here on earth is not as important as the time here and hereafter. And it was only then that I realised that massive big sign had actually been answered. If that's not a big sign to say that my watch had stopped and started again and time here on earth is not as important as the time here in the after, I don't know what other sign is, is bigger than that. And it still took me a, a while for the penny to drop. That was amazing. And I just thought, oh, wow. OK, so I carried on my journey of sort of spirituality and soul searching and everything like that. And my born again Christian friend asked me to go to church and I didn't really want to go. It was a, it was a Sunday, obviously. I went. I decided that I haven't got anything else to do. I'll go. And I went into the room and everyone was sitting in a semicircle and they were starting to pray out loud. And although I don't find that embarrassing now, I did then and I was I wanted to leave. But then this woman, she was behind me and she just started to talk. And she said, there's only one that you can put your full trust in, and that's God. And in that moment, I can only describe it as being a pure, clean light lit up from the core of my heart, the whole of my body and slammed shut again within a split second. And it was so powerful that I sat up and I looked around and I thought, did anyone else feel that? No one else had been affected except me. And to this day, that's a really powerful experience that I had. I knew it was from a lot from God. I knew that, but it was like I'd never realised until I had read a tafsir on a verse that had always made me a bit puzzled. I really didn't understand it. It was Surah Nur, verse 35, and it talks about his light and there being a lamp and then being inside glass and 
an olive tree and some oil and a light upon light. And I never understood that verse. I thought it was beautiful, but I never understood it until I read the tafsir. Then I realised that it's actually Allah's guidance where he actually gives you light, his guidance and his light. And that's where the light of God had actually ignited the light that was very small inside my heart, which is your, my natural fitra. And it was, you know, I was on this soul searching journey towards him and he had actually ignited that light to sort of illuminate the pathway, if you like. Amazing. And it wasn't until I'd finished my university degree and I went to Nottingham to do a master's degree that I met my first ever Muslim. I didn't even know it was a religion back then. You know, we're talking about quite a few years ago. And it was only then that I realised that it was a religion and I asked loads of questions. We just clicked and I started asking loads of questions. I started debating with her. Uh, I was a bit of a feminist then. So it was like, you know, I was asking loads and loads of questions. And it was after about six months period, I decided that um, I would take my Shahada. And that's when I became a Muslim. When I first said that I was going to become a Muslim, I actually rang my mum and I let her know. And she rung me the night before to say good luck. She says she doesn't remember doing that, but she did. And then after that, it kind of, I think they would think it was a phase. And unfortunately, it hasn't actually sat well with my parents, me becoming Muslim. My dad tolerates it, but he almost disinherited me because I had changed so much. I think for the better, and he'll probably admit that it was for the better, but there's certain things that I couldn't do anymore. I couldn't do certain celebrations and traditions. And and I think that's what caused him upset. And he doesn't like the hijab either. So it's always been a bit of a, an issue. I have a twin brother who was forever mocking me, but he doesn't do that anymore. So Alhamdulillah, it's a lot better than it was, but um, I think we tolerate to tolerate each other if we don't talk about religion. The first thing that I struggled with, the hijab, because I'd never worn anything on my head. So I kind of wore it like a wrap. So it was twisted and you could still see my neck right at the beginning. And this is why you have to be patient with re reverts because, you know, I, I wear it. I wear it properly now. But I mean, I didn't then for six months. It took me ages to sort of bring it down. And I was doing my master's degree and all the way through that I was sort of changing my appearance, sort of wearing more loose clothes and wearing hijab in the twisted sense. I finally said, right, I'm going to bring the hijab down now so that you see it much lower and covering underneath my chin and everything. I went into university and the administrator's office went, oh, so that's why you're wearing it. We thought you had cancer. And it was that moment I thought it really helps if to wear something properly so that you actually represent your faith properly because all this time for about six months I've been giving the wrong impression but anyway alhamdulillah the hijab was probably the thing that took me longest and then I think the other thing that is a real struggle is having my parents and my brother who I love dearly not understanding my faith and not being able to talk about it without it becoming something that we disagree with and, and that's the sad point that's the most hardest I think. Coming from a non-Muslim environment and learning about Islam, they come with, the majority of reverts, I would say, come with a genuine longing to learn and and to worship Allah in the best way that they can. But they also have a lot of non-Islamic habits that they take in when they, as soon as they take their shahada. And it takes a little while for them to sort of move away from that lifestyle. And they need knowledge, correct knowledge, and a lot of patience. Some people with the best of intentions will actually bombard reverts with a lot of knowledge and books and, you know, and some people can be really harsh towards reverts when actually what they've taken on board is quite a lot already and they just need a little bit of time and patience to sort of process things and internalise that and then make those changes. So I think that's what, what really needs to be people to be aware of really. I've been a revert for a long time. I just know what it's like when you first enter into Islam and it can be a little bit overwhelming. So much knowledge and um, so many people giving you advice and tips and you don't know what you have to sift through what's culture, what's politics, what people's preferences to actually then realising what the true religion is. The reason why I'm doing it is because I'm a revert and I want other reverts to know that it's OK. You're going to find your way. You're going to find your own journey. And your relationship with Allah is very unique between you and him. It's not always going to be the same with as other people's. So we're here to support you. Everyone's relationship with Allah is very unique. 
and to take your time and to just enjoy the process. Your relationship with Allah is unique and your journey is unique, but still valid and still important. I've never received a support from Solace, but um, I do work for Solace and I do find Solace within my work just by being with other sisters and knowing the nature of the organisation. So through my work, I'm getting sisterhood, if you like, and support that way. But I've never received one to one support. Many reverts, when they come to Islam or have been in Islam for a while, they may be tested and they may be going through difficulties and struggles and they may not have family that are nearby. They may not have family that understand and they may not have people in the community even know that they're going through struggles because maybe they're in an isolated area or maybe it's because they don't want to speak or haven't got anyone to speak to about their tests that they're going through. So Solace is able to give that one to one support and that patience, that compassion and a listening ear. And I think that's really important to be able to feel grounded and continue on their journey of their faith with that compassionate support from Solace.